There are ways that we can heal sufficiently and begin to access dimensions of ourselves that provide that self-nourishment. But it doesn't happen when you're steeped in childhood trauma and all of the incoherence in your life is unaddressed. Perhaps if you become a vegan or a vegetarian too soon and for reasons that are related to being right and good, you're so much in your trauma field, so little motivated by the curiosity of listening to your body and seeking the already there pleasure of self-nourishment that your body's gonna show you. This isn't it and it doesn't work and you're not ready. I had already put my Hashimoto's thyroiditis into remission with the diet that I share in my books and in Vital Mind Reset. And it's an ancestral type of diet. And I already started to translate this into my private practice at the time that was focused on helping women to come off of medications and first offering their systems a signal of safety, chiefly through this anti-inflammatory diet. So I'd already had this experience and begun to have pretty remarkable success, not only in helping patients to taper off of medications, but to reclaim experiences of vitality, resolution of chronic illness, discontinuation of non-psychiatric medications, let alone psychiatric, I had already seen this. So I knew that there was something to this diet thing. And of course, the mindset shift that accompanies reclaiming your power of choice. Because if there is one choice that we make all day, every day, it's what do I put in my mouth? And so the ritual of reclaiming that begins to shift your system out of stress physiology and into regenerative physiology. I'm a firm believer of that. So I had already had these experiences when I began to work with my mentor, Nick, in 2014. I am a believer that living proof is the greatest inspiration, right? So that's why I focus on publishing case reports and case series and randomized trials and gathering testimonial videos from people who have worked with my program and my approach. And I don't want to take health, wellness, and dietary advice from somebody who appears unwell. So when I, you know, when I met him late in his sixties and he did not have a single health ailment, did not wear eyeglasses for reading and had more energy than could be contained in one human, I was deeply inspired. And that was before I learned about his outcomes, which have as far as I'm aware, not been matched in the scientific literature. And these are in neurodegenerative illnesses, in you know cancer diagnoses, including terminal cancer across the board. So I always felt that he had the answer to everything. So he was such a positive parent figure for me. And it was very inspirational for me to orient this sort of like just crystallizing awareness around the power of nutrition, what I was seeing in my practice, what I had been experiencing in my own body and my own health trajectory now felt like it had a home because the system that he worked with is a, a 12 diet model and is inspired by, you know, folks like Weston Price and Pottinger and the idea that ecologically in these different niches across the world, we develop a balanced nervous system in tune with the available environment and associated nutrients, right? So this is why you have folks, you know, Eskimos who eat primarily fat and meat, and you have Amazonians who eat primarily plants, right? So there is not one diet. However, there is this spectrum of diets. He did not believe that veganism was included in the spectrum. And he helped me to understand that the types of folks who would come to my practice, specifically those struggling with you know, so-called multiple chemical sensitivity with depression, with autoimmunity, with allergies, that these individuals are best balanced with a highly acidic meat and red meat specifically and fat containing diet. So Nick essentially helped me to understand my success and contextualized the patients that I had been working with as parasympathetic dominance. So I go into this more in Vital Mind Reset. However, briefly, parasympathetic dominance have strong parasympathetic tone in their system, which results in things like reactive hypoglycemia. So these folks you know, have this roller coaster of blood sugar and easily gain weight, and they are often, you know, sort of dreamers, visionaries, bohemians, outside of the box, thinkers, explorers, and they typically experience specific pathologies 
if you want to call them that. So, you know, as I mentioned, hypothyroidism, these allergy issues, autoimmunity, and they on a cancer spectrum are the ones who experience, you know, so-called liquid tumors, right? So lymphomas, leukemias, whereas the sympathetic dominants are the, you know, the thin, uptight, more rigid types, right? So the kinds who become doctors or lawyers. And, you know, he would say, you know, it's like the surgeon who eats like a candy bar all day and he's like totally fine. So as I learn more about polyvagal theory and the ways in which the nervous system adapts to early life trauma, the paras are those more attuned to freeze response probably. And the sympathetic dominance are those more attuned to fight and flight. So Nick always said that patients want to eat the diet that will heal them. And that explained why so many of the vegans and vegetarians, which was probably the majority of the patients coming to my practice would light up like a Christmas tree when I would give them my, you know, red meat bolognese, recipe to start out their month-long dietary journey with. So at that point, I had seen that this high red meat, animal food-based diet worked. I had the proof, I had the evidence, I had the context. And I also knew that it wasn't about a philosophy or about ethics. This was just about reclamation of choice and potentially aligning with high nutrient density, anti-inflammatory foods at a moment of health crisis in one's life. So Nick's approach was a diet for life for the most part, right? And what I began to observe is that, you know, my patients would do vital mind reset protocol and folks online were doing this protocol. And what was happening was they were beginning to reconnect to their own intuition and to go on their own food journey and their own life journey. And so I actually think that because we are in this zeitgeist right now of psycho-emotional maturation, right? We're going from our collective adolescence into our adulthood, understanding what it is to take personal responsibility, understanding what it is to resolve our projections and idealizations so that we can actually step into the sovereignty of adult consciousness. It makes sense to me that Things have changed, you know, since I first was exposed to these concepts. And now we are each on our own really spiritual journey in understanding how to exercise the power of choice around self-sustenance. And so this portal, you know, that I move through and that my, you know, patients and online folks would move through is really about knowing what you can no longer unknow, right? So now you understand that your choices matter. And they actually specifically matter in the resolution of internal incoherence. So that leads me a bit to my experience, which is that, you know, I was eating this probably more than what would be recommended through his model, more red meat than, you know, would be consistent with a sympathetic diet, probably because I was still in addiction around the stress physiology of sympathetic dominance, right? In my fight or flight, I really liked being revved, especially when I was still living in New York. Fast forward to 2020 and I adopted my first pet. I adopted my cat, Mushu, and shortly thereafter adopted his soulmate, <laughs> intuitively, who is named Bitty Kitty. Shortly thereafter, began to raise chickens. I remember the day that I, you know, had cooked some sort of a red meat filet mignon or something like that as I did. And my kitty, I have a lot of boundary issues with my animals because my inner child is in charge of them and she wants them around all the time on the table and whatever else. So Bitty Kitty's on the kitchen table and I'm eating and I caught her gaze and she's looking in my eyes with her big, beautiful green eyes. And I'm putting my fork into this filet mignon and I burst into tears and I just had an experience of being jolted out of a way of being that I'm not sure I'll ever revert to. I stopped eating red meat. Then I stopped making the Italian chicken stock that I made literally every week of my life and was, you know, my, my children's favorite food, my mom's recipe. I stopped eating that because, you know, holding that chicken after having held my beloved chickens in my yard, it just was not possible. And I remember talking to one of my girlfriends at the time who has cats as pets. And she said, you know what? I would eat my cats if I was starving, right? Like if end of days, you know, I would eat them. And I thought that's it. This isn't about, you know, some sort of right or wrong 
spiritual path. It's about internal coherence. If she would eat her cats, then it certainly makes sense that she would continue to eat meat and there wouldn't be that internal tension, right? So it's always the war inside that becomes illuminated. And then the steps to aligning with one's self and reconciling those seemingly irreconcilable parts inside is the task at hand. It's been several years now that I have eaten a pescatarian diet and I joke that nobody better get me a fish as a pet because I need some time to adjust and adapt. But I have given this a lot of consideration and what I've sort of come to is that there are times in our early disconnection from you know the earth, from nature, from each other, from ourselves, where the physiology and probably specifically stress physiology of an animal that is killed to be eaten is highly adaptive and is a gift actually. And to comport oneself around that gift with reverence and gratitude and some sort of a, a sacred awareness that you know this animal is offering you something that you need energetically, chronically, biologically, however you want to look at it. I think that over time, we can unlock and unleash enough of our inner energetic resources. I mean, that's obviously why people can live without food or water and have done so for decades. Breathitarians know this <laughs> and water fasters know this and frugivores know this. Uh, there are ways that we can heal sufficiently, integrate sufficiently, and begin to access dimensions of ourselves that provide that self-nourishment. But it doesn't happen when you're steeped in childhood trauma and all of the incoherence in your life is unaddressed, right? So perhaps if you become a vegan or a vegetarian too soon, and for reasons that are related to being right and good, you're so much in your trauma field and you're so little motivated by the curiosity of listening to your body and seeking the already there pleasure of self-nourishment that your body's going to show you, you know, this isn't it and it doesn't work and you're not ready. And not that it's like a readiness, like a linear thing. However, you know, for me, it has been, and I'm careful, you know, not to imply that I am more healed, you know, more spiritually attuned or somehow superior. And that's why I can eat this way. It's just that I listened to that inner calling and I actually felt the signature of lasting change, which is relief. When I personally shifted my diet in this way, I, I felt I actually continued to feel immense relief. And if I just felt like I'm doing the right thing and I need other people to do the right thing in order for me to feel justified in my rightness, odds are, you know, I would probably struggle with symptoms. And the transition on a health level has been totally unremarkable. For years, I have not noticed much of anything. However, I do have awareness around the fact that there is a potential nocebo hexing in there because I do still carry the belief that there are nutrients that are not available, you know, through a vegetarian diet. It's what I studied for many years in the early part of my career. And it's possible, you know, that I could then create that reality over years, right? Where I am becoming nutrient depleted over years, because often the patients that I would work with were vegetarian for several years before the shit hit the fan for them. And they were invited to explore, you know, their relationship to what it was that they were putting in their body.